call to order the uh, March 16th meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council Ordinance Committee. Ms. Peterson, will you please call the roll? Bendy White, Chair. Here. Grant House. Here. Frank Hotchkiss. Here. Okay, and the item for us is continuing the, the discussion about the medical marijuana dispensary ordinance revisions. And uh, Mr. Cato, would you like to lead us through this? Thank you, Chair White. I'm going to keep this as short as possible because we have a lot to go over today. And, I mean, you were all at the February 23rd meeting. Okay, but at that meeting, just to recap for members of the public, the council directed ordinance committee to consider reducing the citywide maximum to five. It seemed like there was a bit of consensus on that. I'm, I'm not sure if it was full consensus. Protect major alcohol and drug rehab facilities. Allow dispensaries near Cottage Hospital and further define operational parameters for storefront dispensary uh, collectives and cooperatives. The topic that I would like to, to start with, and I also request that um, the Ordinance Committee kind of finalize this whole section as the allowable locations part. Part of the reason is I won't be here for the next meeting, and I think it's going to take a bit of time to go through all of the, uh, the definitions and collectives and all that stuff that uh, City Attorney is going to be going over. So I do, I do um, ask that we try to finish this one up today. Okay, so we were looking at recovery facilities, and you may recall um, there was some jockeying towards the end of the last meeting, and and they were, and the council was looking at maybe eliminating the Salvation Army, the area on the Salvation Army Hospitality House down on Chapala Street. That was um, a proposal that was going around, and what what we were directed to do was to look at all the major all the major recovery facilities and look at an appropriate distance for that. You know, the idea was not to use that as a, as a um, subterfuge, I guess, to, to ban them citywide, but to find a reasonable distance around them. So that's what I did, and I asked for CADA with help, CADA with that. That's the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Jen Lemberger, who has been a member of the Speaking of the Public at just about every hearing that we've had, um, she helped with that. In fact, she assembled the list. She provided me a list of 41 um, facilities, and 17 of those were considered high priority. And the reason that they were considered high priority was either they, um, they were treatment facilities or detox facilities, and, the, and either then the volume of people that were either living at these places or the volume of people who would come there every day for treatment or for um, recovery. Now, of the 17 provided, only six actually affected the uh, affected the areas that had been that I showed you on February 23rd, and these are listed in the staff report as well as on the overhead here. These are the list of 17. At the request of of CADA, I kept the addresses. I didn't map them. I'm not, they're not going to be on the map. So, see the result of of some of these uh, the fact that these I have on the map, but I don't show them on the map. And but the, it was okay to list where they are. So some of these you may know where they are. So when we when I mapped the recovery facilities, I looked at a number of different radii, protection radii from 250 feet, 250, 500, 750, and 1,000. And again, I was looking for the balance between protection and um, going to an outright ban. Mm -hmm. And I found 500 to be most appropriate. When you looked at 1,750, that just eliminated too many of the areas, at least in my opinion, and I'll show you that. And 250 feet, I thought, wasn't enough protection. It's not as, so then we've settled on 500. It's the same amount that we provide to parks and to schools, and I'll show you the result. Also, uh, at the last hearing, there was consensus, it seemed to us, to eliminate the Mesa area and to keep the cottage hospital area. So I eliminated the blocks within 500 feet of those 17, and I'll show you what that is. Oh, while I'm on this subject, you received an email this morning from Ron Werf from Cottage Hospital, and um, apparently, well, what he told me, not he, but one of his staff people, told me was that um, on the list of 
41, Cottage Hospital has a detox facility that wasn't included on that list, and they asked for that detox facility to be put on, added to the list of 17, just to let you know if we do that, that eliminates the entire Cottage Hospital area. I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, so here we are, the maps again. On the outer State Street area, there are no recovery facilities in this area that were given to me, either actually either high priority or um, lower priority. So there's no change here. Um, to Delavina, this is the, there's no change here. If we just count the 17, if we went with the, all the 41, this block would be eliminated, this block here. In the mission. Excuse me, Mr. Cato, is this uh, considering a 500 a foot? Fi yes, limit? a 500 foot. Thank you. And if we look at mission, you can see that, oh, so this is slightly different. This shows the same pinkish area as before on, the, on this map that shows where they would be allowed. The blue shows where they would have been allowed on the previous proposal, February 23rd. So what I'm trying to show you here is that because of one of the 17 major recovery facilities, this block, the 1700 block of State Street would be eliminated. And if you went to 1,000 feet, this entire area mission would be eliminated. Next is downtown east and west. Now here is where the, I said six of these recovery facilities had an effect on the area. One of them was up on that mission area. The other five were, were, in, this, with, were in the downtown east and west. And primarily the area that is now eliminated, and could you turn, can you turn one of the lights off? Maybe make it easier is this whole area that's in blue stripe, but without the pink underneath. That was an area that was formally allowed. And again, down here, this is around the Salvation Army. This is um, the zero block of East Gutierrez Street, and then this area, which is the Community Development Building at 630 Garden Street and, the, and its environs. Those are the areas that would be eliminated. And then um, if you went to 1,000 feet, just from the 17, you'd be left with this block right here, and that's the Carrillo commuter lot. That is um, floodway. I mean, that's Mission Creek. And then on this is Mission Creek on this side, and the entire store over here. You'd be left with the 100 block of West Ortega Street. And you'd be left with this area around Carrillo and uh, La Laguna. Now, if you went to 1,000 feet of, of the 41 units, you'd be left with basically this little spot here and the 100 block of West Carrillo, or uh, Ortega, sorry. Um, go to Milpa Street. The, the 500 feet from recovery facilities didn't have an effect. The only other one actually that, that affected this on the 17 was the rescue mission. It's located here. And even if you went to 1,000, this is already 1,000 from Casa Esperanza. However, if you added, if you went to the full 41, you would eliminate this area altogether. Cottage Hospital, I didn't draw this map, but if we, you know, if, if the detox center is within Cottage Hospital proper, which is this block, and if you, drive, if you go 500 feet, it basically goes all the way up to Quinto, around here to Delavina, and takes in this whole area. So 500 feet would eliminate the Cottage Hospital area altogether. That's pretty much all I have for you. I, I want to ask you to make your final recommendation to council on the cottage hospital area, the, the MESA, the protection, the radii, and, and then hopefully when we're done with that, finish that and then go on to the discussion of the definition and, and the whole collective cooperative thing. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Well, of course, uh, the two are, are intertwined, uh, so... Um, that's at least the way I see it, um, but I'm certainly glad to take, if the uh, committee wishes, we could, we could take this on in this fashion. Mr. House? I'll just, start. I'll just jump right in. And, um, the, uh, the question that I have, which is a fundamental one, and one that I think that we're going to um, hopefully we'll wrestle it to the ground here and give it back to council with some recommendation is, um, what, ex what exactly is the protection from and what's the danger. And the connection that I have here is that a well-regulated facility using the new regulations in particular that we have here will be really 
no danger to anyone, given what we've already got on the ground in terms of our mapping. Now, we talked at the city council level about um, adding a couple or three, some, some number of large facilities that maybe we would want to you know, work with. And we already talked about the lower Chapala Street area near Salvation Army, which I think there was a sense that that kind of made some sense. And that was one of those kinds of um, locations that was plausible and, and based on the conversation we'd had up to that point. Okay, kind of get that. Um, the rescue mission, but that's actually kind of in a no man's land anyway, and it's not affecting anything as it is. And then the other is Casa Esperanza. Um, but we have two examples and I say this to my colleagues as well as to uh, the staff, two examples of facilities that have operated actually for nine and ten years in a below-the-radar kind of fashion and have had literally no impacts whatsoever in our community in terms of law enforcement issues or anything else. And they stand for me as a model without even our regulations of what could be. So um, I'm not... I appreciate all the work you did with the list of 41 and honing it down to 17 and now 6 that would actually have an impact with the 500 feet. But I appreciate the approach that we were using getting to this point, which is a block face kind of approach rather than a radius kind of approach. And looking at the locations in the city that would make sense from a business perspective or uh, convenience or, or separation from uses. And I think that we're pretty much there. I mean, adding the uh, area around um, the um, Salvation Army to me made sense. I, th I think we kind of got that. But because of the limited access to the facilities and all the other regulations that we have here, I um, don't feel compelled to add a whole bunch more of other facilities with radii around them um, and to try to use that approach. I think that we've, we've pretty well nailed addressing directly the concerns that we've heard from the public. In fact, I would argue for adding back um, as a non-conforming, and Mr. Wiley should probably perk up on this because I haven't talked to you about this, um, that the uh, location on State Street for the one upper State Street um, existing location, that we just add that block face back in again as a non-conforming so that that particular operation could continue to operate in that location and not have to move, not be forced to move, because they have been such a literally good neighbor for that neighborhood and have the support of their surrounding neighbors there. And I think that um, we should be going the other way in a case like that, where the radius doesn't wouldn't make any difference one way or another. They've been a good neighbor. They've been there for years and years, and there's no point to making them move to some other place. So I put that into the conversation. So I don't, I don't think that we should do any more except for the lower Chapala Street area that we've already talked about and possibly add back the block face there in the 3,900 or some 3,000 block of uh, State Street as a nonconforming so that the existing um, operator there can stay in their position and not have to move. Thank you, Mr. House. I've, I'm, I'm feeling as if we're jumping ahead to our conclusions there a little bit after without having heard the. Well, I'm just putting I'm putting it on the table. So it's out know, there. Okay. Yes, definitely. But I think that we need to frame it. Um, if we follow this path of attempting to put circles around all sorts of treatment facilities within the city of Santa Barbara, it begins to beg the question: um, with these regulations, of what harm? would these facilities be to anyone in that neighborhood, even, say, 500 feet from, say, a recovery house or a, or, or a treatment facility of some sort. And it, it's really based on this fundamental premise that the regulations restrict access from anyone who doesn't have a valid doctor's recommendation, which is verifiable and verified, and they follow those rules. That's in the security system that we've got in place in these regulations. I just... I just can't make the connection between a system like that and any damage whatsoever that it would have to anyone in the surrounding area. So the, your statement is you see the regulations as reducing the need for uh, location restriction, and you've, you have laid out some various location restrictions, but that's less 
important for you than uh, because of the tight regulations on the system? I think that's itself? the basic idea, and it's, it's sort of part of what I've been arguing for a while, and that is we need to get these regulations into place because they really do address the concerns we've been hearing from the public in a very rigorous way, mm -hmm. better than any circle on a map. They truly make these, uh, if they are to be located anywhere in a city, they would be a good neighbor, only one in any given area, and only a limited number, all abiding by these regulations. So I appreciate all the work that was done in this, but but it just highlights to me and brought up for me the question of, um, well, heck, you know, if we follow these regulations, we're not, it's, these places will be uh, under intense scrutiny and they will have, there'll be an accountability factor. So if any of them become bad actors, they're out of here. So anyway, that's my point. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss? Uh, let me rep <coughs> re reply to Mr. House. Um, and I understand what he's saying is right about strict regulation. But... The problem isn't that there's no danger to anyone. It's a matter of temptation. So if we have marijuana dispensaries near a recovery facility, it's not that the person who's trying to recover is necessarily going to go in and purchase, but um, I have anecdotal, I won't say evidence, but stories about people going from uh, or, or being in a, in a getting legally getting marijuana with, with the uh, doctor's approval and then turning around and selling it on the street. Yeah, which is bad stuff. But if you do that near a recovery facility, it's like you have an audience waiting for you. And there's no, we're not going to make a perfect rule here, but I do think that it does make sense not to have uh, facilities, uh, mar uh, marijuana outlets near recovery facilities for that reason. And the same thing for schools and parks, which I guess we don't want to get into, but I just want to so understand what I'm thinking. So it's not that the facility itself won't do its job. They probably will do their best because they're going to be watched very carefully by all of us, um, by the authorities. But the, the bad players take advantage of that. And the um, email that we got from uh, Cottage Hospital, I thought was, I mean, this is an interesting point. Our, he states it well. It's from Ron Verft, who was the president and CEO of uh, Cottage Hospital, I think he says, uh, increasing there, he's talking about recovering people at Cottage Hospital, increasing their access to marijuana during this time, recovery time, will not be helpful and may even undermine these patients in their attempt to become and remain sober. Of course, if somebody's intent on not remaining sober, that's what they're going to do. But if we can decrease temptation, if I can put it that way, it might be a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Hotchkiss. Um, I'd like to ask our, our good counsel, do you have any thoughts about this interrelationship of location? And we have a package from your office, which uh, we will be discussing today. Um, do you have a sense that the, 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 the definitions and the locations are separate items, as Mr. Cotto was, was discussing? We just deal with location first and then get the definition? Uh, do you think that that's a perfectly good way to go mr. chair I, I can I guess I can see the point that they are interrelated and it, it really gets back to this larger point as to what is legal under state law uh, it, you know in a, a lot of these dispensaries not just in Santa Barbara but statewide uh, up until recently have appeared to be selling marijuana uh, they're not they do not appear to be observing the statutory requirements that this be a relationship between a qualified patient and a primary caregiver very uh, tightly defined terms expressly defined terms and so w what we've seen in California is this uh, this uh, uh, rise of uh, storefront dispensaries and you just seem like anyone can walk in and appear to be, you know, spending several hundred dollars purchasing marijuana. You look at the statutes, and that's one of the things I was hoping to do today with the committee, is that doesn't seem to be allowed at all. Uh, for one thing, you're supposed to only be getting um, medical marijuana from a um, primary caregiver uh, or cultivating it yourself if you're a patient. So uh, when, when we talk about... Uh, 
you know, this imp impacting neighborhoods or being uh, a, a bad situation next to a recovery facility, I think we're talking about illegal conduct. And I think the concept, if you know, of looking at strictly enforcing the cooperative collective model and uh, strictly enforcing the state law requirements that the marijuana only be de distributed on a reimbursement basis, that the, the individuals who have cultivated it are primary caregivers and they're only being reimbursed for their expenses uh, is, is very much related to this uh, you know, potential for abuse. If we really go that route and with an ordinance that says essentially that storefront dispensaries would be a very narrow thing, a very limited thing, I could see where there would be less concern that they might be close to, say, cottage or, or its recovery facilities. So I tend to agree it's all interrelated. Yeah, and, and uh, in asking that loaded question of Mr. Wiley, uh, I'm sort of speaking my orientation, which is that the definition is, is as important or if not more important than the than the location question, but um, I'm also t attempting to come up with a structure for this meeting, and I would presume it would be, or the way I'd like to do it is to have our staff input. Mr. Wiley's spoken to a couple of the particulars of of the package that we received, uh, and I would ask. But the customary uh, sequence is that we have our staff give us a. a, a, a a narrative, and then we have uh, questions, and then we have uh, public input. And so I will, uh, I'm going to say I don't have, uh, I'll, I'll, on the location question, uh, I feel like the definition is more important than location, and that I still feel, even though there is a, um, a greater risk at Cottage, I appreciate Mr. Wirth's uh, concern, uh, I would get back to definition as a way to be controlling perhaps the distribution of cannabis in the in the uh, in any area, and that I I feel as if uh, you know there's very good access to Vicodin in the cottage hospital area, and we're glad that it is, and so forth and so on. So um, that's that's my general. Uh, orientation. I'm also frustrated with the staff uh, dealing with so, I mean, look at the time that must have gone into that, folks. That's what we're talking about. We heard some tough stories about our finances, and I look at these maps and, and just taking um, the brain power that's gone into that, I, I'm uh, struggling with that myself. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Wiley to back up and then give a um, a bit of a presentation about about your uh, again we received a, a lengthy memo and are there any copies of that available has the public seen that already mr. Wiley no and, and mr. chair if I may I, I hope that um, uh, mr. Wiley would be willing to back up the assertions that no selling when the state charges sales tax and um, only form I of... let him get back to sort of... Get, get, yeah, sort of I, I just think this is really important because, um, and only from a primary caregiver when in fact dispensaries are, um, by the Attorney uh, General's guidelines, uh, intended to provide the uh, medicine to primary caregivers. So um, there's some basic uh, things here. And having been a member of a cooperative, which had to do with food uh, before, we actually bought our food, paid, uh, you know, paid the money, but we were part of a cooperative. We know that those um, things can exist and there can be a storefront. And it says so right here in the Attorney General's guidelines. So um, I'm, I'm interested to see how it can be justified that there's no selling when, in fact, that's what happens in a, a dispensing um, cooperative or collaborative. So um, please uh, do your best because I don't know how you're going to convince me that that's not a possibility when the state charges sales tax. So you, you made two, some very clear assertions. One is that no selling um, in a legal dispensary, and that doesn't make any sense to me because the state charges sales tax and requires sales tax to be collected based on the transfer, if you will, of ownership. Um, and then that's ha that handle is handled by an actual payment of some sort in some dispensing facility. And secondly, that um, 
that you can only get the medicine from a primary caregiver is if the dispensary were to be the primary caregiver, which clearly by the Attorney General's guidelines is not the case because it talks about the um, facilities dispensing to the primary caregiver and or the patient. So some of these um, basic assumptions that you just gave us a moment ago, I'm probably going to have to challenge really hard. And it worries me a little bit that we're moving into that territory where we're trying to um, use like Los Angeles' approach to make all of these things illegal when we really have an experience of successful ones for many years that have used a model that includes uh, um, buying and selling, right, of the, um, of, the, um, of the medicine using the cooperative model. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about that and hope you'll address it directly because I'm, I'm worried about this as a starting point. I'm not hearing you being on there. Uh, Mr. Me. Chair, members of the committee, as a lawyer, I, I can only deal with the statutes, and you know, I'll, I'll, and I think it's important for me to walk you through them. Uh, I can't explain what the franchise tax board is doing. I, you know, I, they do what they do, and and I've just got to go by the what what law is on the books, and the best place to start is the initiative, the Prop 215 which was before the voters in November of 1996. This is the actual initiative itself, although there, there's a second page we'll get to. Uh, the Compassionate Use Act of 1996. It took effect January 1st, 1997. And this was all there was. And, and we'll get into why that was be apparently a problem later. But uh, the people of the state of California hereby find and declare uh, the following purposes, and I think the main point here is the lack of detail, and number one, to ensure that seriously ill Californians have a right to obtain and use marijuana for, me for medical purposes. Uh, they talk about sort of the, the medical conditions that might uh, cause someone to, to use medical marijuana, and you will see uh, the statement, or any other illness for which marijuana provides relief, which, in, as I see it, then translated into a very broad uh, a definition of the sort of illness that, uh, for which marijuana could be recommended. Um, it uses terms, patients and primary caregivers. It didn't really define those terms. Uh, and if you... Um, Go to the next section. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm go back to that. B there. If you look at the end of B, and this is a key aspect, uh, use marijuana for medical purposes upon the recommendation of a physician are not subject to criminal prosecution or sanction. That's decriminalization, and there's a difference between decriminalizing something and legalizing something. So when we get to the SB 420 statutes, which were enacted in 2003, you will see there's some significant things uh, related to the fact that all they're really doing is decriminalizing. You can't be prosecuted for this, but they're not necessarily making it legal. And I think one of the biggest aspects of that is this lack of a real definition of a real statutory scheme to provide medical marijuana to people. The state legislature, uh, rightly or wrongly, I, I would say probably wrongly, backs into this area by only decriminalizing it. So then, Danny, if we can go to page two. So C there, again, is a decriminalization. It says, well, a doctor can't be pr punished or denied any right or privilege for having recommended marijuana. And then Section 11357B, that's, that's been on the books a long time. That's the, the main section that criminalizes the possession or sale of marijuana. Uh, and some of these other sections, 11358, I believe that's uh, uh, possession for sale, uh, cultivation from, of marijuana, uh, shall not apply to a patient or to a patient's primary caregiver who possesses or cultivates marijuana for the personal medical purposes of the patient upon the written or oral recommendation or approval of a physician. And then they, they get into the definition of a primary caregiver, 
the individual designated by the person exempted under this section who has consistently assumed responsibility for the housing, health, or safety of that person. Consistently assumed responsibility for three major aspects of, of someone's life, housing, health, or safety. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that later, because that really, I think, is a key aspect of, of how a storefront dispensary operates and how it really is difficult, I think, for a lot of these storefront dispensaries to, to really assert that they're a primary caregiver and how when someone walks in off the street for the first time and they get marijuana, anyone has a consistently assumed responsibility for the housing, health, or safety of that person. Um, Danny, if you could go to, to three. Then, in, in 2003, the state legislature enacted what we have called the, the SB 420 statutes. I w it's probably about three or four pages in the Health and Safety Code of detailed statutes dealing with this, but this subject, but by and large, the more detail is in establishing this county identification card system, how that works, and in identifying uh, limits on the amount of marijuana you can possess or cultivate uh, as, a, as a qualified patient. Um, and here are the limits. Uh, a qualified patient or primary caregiver may possess no more than eight ounces of dried marijuana per qualified patient. In addition, a qualified patient or primary caregiver may also maintain no more than six mature or 12 immature marijuana plants per qualified patient. I'm only mentioning this because this statute's been declared unconstitutional. And why was that? And it gets into some of the, uh, the questions of well, how much can a city do in this area? How much can a city regulate? Well, I was showing you what the voters approved as a voter initiative, and that's up here. It's, it was not a constitutional initiative, but it was a statutory initiative. In terms of hierarchy of authority, it's right up there next to a constitutional initiative, it's, and uh, it voter approved. It means what it means and it, it can't be tinkered with by the, the state legislature, the people in Sacramento. But here they tinkered with it in, in this SB 420 statute and they said, despite the fact that the, the Prop 215 didn't mention no more than eight ounces or six mature and 12 immature plants, the state legislature imposed this and the courts declared this unconstitutional. They said, because you haven't been consistent with the initiative. And if you do anything, state legislature and, frankly, a city council or a board of supervisor, if you do anything inconsistent with Prop 215, the courts are probably going to declare it unconstitutional. And that gets into some of the things that we, we might get into today or later. Uh, so the next one, Danny. But, you know, actually, going back to 215, what... I have to say, uh, if looking at Prop 215, looking at the SB 20 statutes, what's going on? Uh, I think the, the voters of the state intended to decriminalize uh, small-scale cultivation of marijuana by individuals or by small groups of individuals. That, in other words, if you had, let's say you had someone who was very sick, really maybe even bedridden, the, the, the initiative was not, uh, I think, designed to say, well, you have to get up and get out of bed and cultivate marijuana in your own backyard. It did recognize this concept of a primary caregiver. It might even be a spouse or a relative or maybe just uh, a, a good friend. Uh, it did recognize that between these individuals, the marijuana could be cultivated and it could be provided to a qualified patient. And when you say that's true on a one-to-one -one basis or a small group of individuals, it then uh, arguably could be true among a larger group of individuals. Let's say it's a dozen individuals, some of whom are, are qualified patients, some of whom are, are friends or relatives and saying, I'll, I'll be your primary caregiver. 
I will help in, in consistently assume responsibility for your health in this area, and I'll, I'll cultivate marijuana in my backyard. And I might even do it for more than one individual. So, um, it, Danny, um, yeah, the next one. Again, um, again, this this is the start of the SB 420 statutes that took effect in January 1st, 2004. Um, primary caregiver, again, you see the same definition that was in the initiative, uh, but with a little bit more detail, may include any of the following. An individual who has been designated as a primary caregiver by more than one qualified patient or person with an identification card. Just to be clear here, you can be a qualified patient or you can be a person with an identification card. It's the same thing. You, you, in order to get an identification card, you have to be a qualified patient, but the statutes use both terms often. If every qualified patient or person with an identification card who has designated that individual as a primary caregiver resides in the same city or county as the primary caregiver. One thing I notice about that is that's bad drafting. I don't know what that, resides in the same city or county as the primary. I don't know many cities that aren't in the, the I, I guess they're referring to unincorporated counties or county area. Um, so uh, the, the question's been asked, can we require someone's primary caregiver only reside in Santa Barbara? And I'd have to say, I don't think so. I think that would be inconsistent with this statute because it says resides in the same city or county as the primary. So I think we'd be limited to say, if you're a qualified patient or a person with an identification card, your primary caregiver uh, has to reside in Santa Barbara County. And that's if that primary caregiver yeah, sure. is doing it for more than one individual. Because look at three there. And oh, I should be clear, I'm just doing excerpts of statutes here because it would get too awkward to try to show the whole thing. And I was only trying to get you relevant excerpts. An individual who has been designated as a primary caregiver by a qualified patient or person with an identification card who re resides in a city or county other than that of the primary caregiver, if the individual has not been designated as a primary caregiver by any other qualified patient or person with an identification card. So if you're, right. Can you if, tell me what that means? I think it means if your primary caregiver doesn't live in your county, that primary caregiver can only be a primary caregiver to one person. So if you said, I, my primary caregiver lives in, in uh, San Luis Obispo County, and that were true and, you know, that person in San Luis Obispo County could only be your, that, that primary caregiver for one person. And again, I'm bringing this up because I think it, we have these statutes. These are not unconstitutional. They're apparently consistent with Prop 215. It seems to relate to this concept of storefront dispensaries. And people who, uh, for all our ordinances regulate, can, can drive up here from Los Angeles and walk into a storefront dispensary and obtain medical marijuana. Uh, Danny, the, can you go to the next one? And, and again, this is a section dealing with decriminalization. Uh, it, it, that's what it's doing is decriminalizing something. Qualified patients, persons with valid identification cards, and the designated primary caregivers who of qualified patients and persons with identification cards who associate within the state of California in order to collectively or cooperatively to cultivate marijuana for medical purposes shall not solely on the basis of that fact be subject to state criminal sanctions. And I'll tell you, most of those code sections deal with possession of marijuana, possessions of large amounts of marijuana, possessions of marijuana for sale, distribution of marijuana, uh, that's, those sorts of things. It's saying we're decriminalizing these things uh, for people who collectively, not people, I'm sorry, qualified patients, 
people with identification cards, and designated primary caregivers who collectively or cooperatively cultivate marijuana. And I think one of the central questions that's been referred to the Ordinance Committee is, will we uh, have an ordinance that requires dispensaries, to storefront dispensaries, to cultivate their own marijuana? This seems to say that's what's required. I think that's what the Attorney General's guidelines are pretty clear about saying, that uh, it, the Attorney General guidelines say under some circumstances, limited circumstances, it may be possible that a storefront dispensary would be legal, would be consistent with the SB 420 statutes, but those circumstances at a minimum would have to be they uh, collectively or cooperatively cultivate their own marijuana. And as a result, I think the thinking is, and I know I think this was the, true in Los Angeles with their ordinance, if you had an ordinance that says, well, if you're going to operate a storefront dispensary in our city, you need to prove to us that you're collectively or cooperatively cultivating your own marijuana in accordance with this, this code section. So. Mr. Hotchkiss? Yeah, excuse me. But when it says California, suddenly we can't get local, or, or we conclude the whole state of California is local. Is that correct? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I, and as a lawyer, we go back to an old rule of law that says the specific controls the general. The specific was that about people within the same county. That's that's quite specific. And here, I think they were just being a little broad and using the term within the state of California. All right, so you think yeah. that the previous applies then? Right, the okay, specific would control the general. All right, yeah. thank you. Now, I, I would say this is kind of the statute that's the heart of the, uh, the, the meat and potatoes of the controversy over collectives and cooperatives. Uh, and again, I've just excerpted some things here. But if you look at the bottom of subsection A, again, it's, it's decriminalizing something. Um, but it is clear, nor shall anything in this section authorize any individual or group to cultivate or distribute marijuana for profit. Well, they didn't decriminalize the cultivation or distribution of marijuana for profit. And then... Uh, subsection, uh, we get to B, subdivision A shall apply to all of the following. So A is the decriminalization, except for cultivation or distribution for profit. Uh, a qualified patient or a person with an ID card who transports or processes marijuana for his or own, her own personal medical use. Again, uh, as I said, someone who grows their own mar medical marijuana and in their desk at home, they have a letter from their doctor recommending that they use that marijuana is apparently not doing anything that can be punished as a crime. And to my knowledge, isn't in the, the district attorneys and, and police departments in the state are not looking for that sort of thing. They're not prosecuting that sort of thing. Uh, and the same would be true. It mentions transports. Uh, if if you, uh, I think this would apply if someone's pulled over, they don't appear to be under the influence of anything like alcohol or drugs, and they're driving in a vehicle, and in the trunk of their car, they have, a, let's say, a small amount of marijuana, an ounce of marijuana, and they have a doctor's recommendation, don't think they can be prosecuted for anything. That's what this, this one uh, subparagraph, I think, is making clear. And then two, a designated primary caregiver who transports processes, assume, you know, in, in cultivating it, it, it then needs to be processed for use, administers, delivers, or gives away, interesting use of the term gives away, any marijuana for medical purposes in amounts not exceeding those established in subdivision A. That's that, those limits that were declared unconstitutional only to the qualified patient of the primary caregiver or to the person with an identification card who has designated the individual as a primary caregiver. So we've gone outside of the, 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 the qualified patient, 
cultivating their own marijuana. And this subparagraph is decriminalizing a designated primary caregiver who transports, processes, administers, delivers, or gives away marijuana for medical purposes to someone who has designated them as their primary caregiver. Then we get to three, and that, again, one, two, and three are talking about what's decriminalized, who's decriminalized, who can't be punished. Any individual who provides assistance to a qualified patient or a person with an identification card or his or her designated primary caregiver. So any individual, that's interesting. Uh, it's not a qualified patient. It's not a primary caregiver. It's any individual who provides assistance to a qualified patient or a person or his or her designated in administering medical marijuana to the qualified patient or acquiring the skills necessary to cultivate or administer marijuana for medical, pur medical purposes to the qualified patient or person. So this is the first time we're talking about somebody who isn't a patient or, or a, a primary caregiver, and they can provide assistance. They can't provide marijuana, that's the way I read that, but they can provide assistance. Um, Danny, yeah, I think we're ready for the next page, yeah. Yeah. Your house. I guess the question about that, if you could back up just for a second, because that's kind of operant right there. Um, the um, here you have someone who's not a qualified care or a primary caregiver, who is um, giving assistance in administering medical marijuana to the qualified patient or person. I imagine it would be also to the caregiver. I mean, in other words, it's, a, it's somebody who's not the primary caregiver. This could very well be a cooperative or collective in the aggregate. Um, based on everything else that was there. So this distinguishes between a, um, um, an or, a, 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 a cooperative or collective, whatever that means, so that's you, the terms that are used here, which would be members only, based on what you said before, right? I, and, I think that's how and most local. people would typically define Definitely a cooperative. And local, yeah. based on, so local and, um, and, um, and, and uh, the guidelines said something about members only. So, um, and so that would be cultivated within that group. But it's a distinction between the primary caregiver and someone who is administering to the patient. Administering medical, whatever administering is. In administering medical marijuana. So the word administering becomes kind of determinative here, right? I mean. Well, no, I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm reading it the same way. It provides assistance. Okay. So the the operative uh, verb, if you will, is providing assistance. Yeah, but in it, assistance to, in what? In 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 administering. In administering medical. Yeah, the the individual is not administering the marijuana. It's pro the individual is providing assistance to a patient or a primary caregiver in administering medical marijuana. Okay. I th Something about that you you called out the distinction between primary caregiver and whomever is being spoken about here that is assisting in the administration of the medical marijuana to the patient. Okay, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, All right, Mr. Wiley, one more question from Mr. Hotchkiss. I'm sorry. Um, a point that maybe I'm oversimplifying here, but in all this, what is implied to me is there's a personal relationship. So it's not a stranger providing assistance, it's your gardener, if you don't know how frequently to water your plants, or, I mean, somebody like that, but that's all a personal, this is, these are people that know each other. Your caregiver is helping you out of the bed in the morning or whatever, mm -hmm. okay? We haven't actually said that, stated that at some point, so, uh, and I bring it up only because that may help shape what we're trying to understand here. No, and, and that's a good point. I, I think when these statutes, and this, this one in particular, came on the books, the idea, I don't know where I got this, but I read it, that there were, was that a lot of people wouldn't know how to cultivate marijuana. They don't have the knowledge or the expertise, and that somebody was going to have to show them how to do that. And uh, I think part of it is someone's going to have to provide them with the seeds or the seedlings in order to do it. And that conceivably could be illegal as well. I, I hope you'll address this point because this to me maybe not, I don't know if that's the right place, but um, when the 
uh, Attorney General said marijuana grown at a collective or cooperative for medical purposes may be, and he lists just five things, provided free to qualified patients and primary caregivers who are members of the collective or cooperative, so that's that membership thing again, but provided in exchange for services rendered to the entity, allocated based on fees that are reasonably calculated to cover overhead costs and operating expenses or any combination of the above. And that was um, making a distinction, I think, between um, the collective or cooperative um, and the patients and primary caregivers in the, in the Attorney General's um, guidance. So I don't know if this is where that came from or where it came from, well, but you I can maybe call next, that out when it's it comes. It's the next section. We okay, were, thank we're you. We're just getting to it, yeah. And as near as I can tell, this is the only SB 420 statute that deals with the subject of money, if you will. A primary caregiver who receives compensation for actual expenses, including reasonable compensation incurred for services provided to an eligible qualified patient or person with an ID card, to enable that person to use marijuana under this article, or for payment for out-of-pocket pocket expenses incurred in providing those services or both shall not on the sole basis be subject to prosecution, decriminalization, that uh, you could get compensation for actual expenses. And they, in defining expenses, they say, which could include reasonable compensation incurred for services. So that's not an article or something you purchased or whatever or utility costs. That's compensation for services provided to an eligible qualified patient uh, to enable that person to use marijuana or for the payment of out-of-pocket expenses. And, you know, a lot of people have, I think, simplified this and say that, that requires these dispensaries to be operated on a not-for-profit basis. That's not really what that says. Reimbursement for expenses is, not, is, is much more limited than a typical not-for-profit operation. Uh, so out-of-pocket expenses, for example, that's, that, you know, you've got maybe water expenses, maybe fertilizer expenses, maybe you use Grolux lights and, and those uh, require additional electricity. The members, uh, the primary caregivers can get reimbursed for that. And the primary caregivers, because note, this is referring to primary caregivers, not just anyone, any individual, can receive reasonable compensation for their services as well. I, I, I think the Attorney General's guidelines make this point. I know the court system has made these, this point uh, a lot, that these statutes are not well drafted. There's a lot of question marks. But they are what they are. I mean, a lot of people have called for the state legislature to to, to jump into this and to, to try to deal with it again. And as far as I know, they're not even, there's nothing even uh, uh, being proposed to make changes to these statutes. But um, I think this, this uh, section in particular leads a lot of people to believe that, uh, and in the as the Attorney General's guidelines mention, that the storefront dispensary uh, would be potentially legal or non-criminal in very limited context. And it would be uh, the sort of context where it would be uh, a, a clearly a cooperative, collective group of individuals. And that um, these individuals have agreed, maybe even in writing, to associate some of them would cultivate the marijuana and be primary uh, caregivers. Some of them would be qualified patients. Uh, the, the marijuana would be cultivated and distributed to only members of the cooperative or collective. And uh, the only money that would change hand would be reimbursement for expenses. And this, that could include reimbursement for, for uh, reasonable compensation for some services rendered. Uh, so we, we get, I think, to the situation the city of L.A. was looking at. And, Danny, if you could um, 
uh, I've got some bullet points here, and I'll tell you, I just what I did was spend some time going over the the Los Angeles ordinance uh, and um, their efforts to to try to have an ordinance that limited storefront dispensaries. And, and I should make it clear. I mean, a lot of people have said, well, you're too restrictive on these things. You're going to drive it into the neighborhoods. I think there's a point to be made. It's in the neighborhoods now because of Prop 215 and because of these statutes. We're not going to undo any of these things in terms of a small group of individuals or even a larger group of individuals who really just keep it among themselves and maybe don't have a storefront. Uh, and I, I don't, as I say, don't see the police department or district attorney's offices even arguing about that with anyone. But it's the storefront dispensary and, and really getting back to what the city's concerns would might be from a zoning perspective that, that kind of brings us here. Uh, so the city of Los Angeles uh, tried to really hammer out how would you identify a, a collective cooperative that operated a storefront and is truly doing it in the way that the SB 420 statutes um, required. So you would expressly require in, an, in such an ordinance that the marijuana be cultivated and distributed only by an officially formed cooperative collective group of individuals and only by qualified members of that cooperative collective, either by qualified patients or primary caregivers. Um, and, I, and I guess I should say, ultimately, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that answering, the committee answering whether it uh, wants to have any of these points in an ordinance, our, our plan, I believe, would be to, to draft, redraft the ordinance and to put whatever points the committee would like to have put in that ordinance. And so, uh, Mr. Chair, just a real quick comment. You're not recommending that we copy LA's ordinance, are you? No, I'm only I mean, saying this, this, is, this goes is how way I... outside of anything that I think that we in Santa Barbara want to. I mean, they they they've taken steps that are are completely contradictory to things that we've been doing so far in, in the drafting of our ordinance. And I'm very, I'd be very concerned if we'd use them even as a model. Well, the nice thing about being a lawyer is I don't have to recommend anything. I'm. <laughs> I, I'm just. This is what they did, and and, and I, you know. And Mr. Wiley, we don't have that. Do we have that here? No, I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Just want to make sure I hadn't missed a homework assignment. There. Thank um, you. So the second point: enforce the cultivation requirement for storefront dispensaries by imposing detailed record-keeping requirements, and by allowing city inspections of the dispensary of the cultivation records and of the location where the medical marijuana is being cultivated, all on minimal advance notice. Uh, I'll, I'll move through these fairly quickly. Expressly require that, this, that a storefront dis dispensary be operated on a cooperative collect, I'm sorry, there's a typo, by a cooperative collective group with a pre-established number of registered members with a minimum time for pre-registration as a member, such as 10 days. Uh, cooperative collectives which operate storefront dispensaries must first register with the city. Uh, that's that's pretty obvious. Express, expressly require that the cooperative collective members who will manage a storefront dispensary be designated and identified to the city in writing and shall include verified home address and contact information. Um, expressly require that the real property owner of a storefront dispensary uh, certify his or her consent to use of their property as a, a dispensary. Signage requirement for storefront dispensaries. You know, if, if these group, if these people have gotten together and they've agreed to cooperate and to do this collectively, they really don't need to advertise. I think that's the thought here. Um, so, where was I? Signage requirements. Minimal signage such as that used for medical offices. Uh, cultivated marijuana may not be visible from any vantage point outside the property where the marijuana is being cultivated, and the area is well secured to prevent trespassers. Prohibit the sale of marijuana under all circumstances and the manufacture or sale of edible marijuana products on a storefront dispensary, at a storefront dispensary. And I believe that last point about edible products is, relates to some health concerns and that these, uh, they're really, uh, isn't any kind of recognized health uh, regulation, health 
department process for verifying the uh, the healthy nature of uh, edible marijuana products. Require storefront dispensaries to close between 8 p.m. and 10 a.m. each day. And then one last one. Impose limits on the amount of dried marijuana which may be stored at a storefront dispensary and limits on the number of plants which may be cultivated at any one time. Now, and this reminds me, it's like, well, the court declared the limits in the SB 420 statutes to be unconstitutional. How is it the, that uh, L.A. or any other city could think that you could then impose limits? And it has to do with this distinction. If, if the, the SB 420 statutes, Prop 215, is about uh, individuals doing this collectively, but when those individuals want to operate a storefront, that can become a local zoning concern, and there might be some, there is, I think, then some authority to uh, impose sort of stricter requirements or radius requirements, for example. Uh, it, it's not mentioned in four, SB 420, but the radius requirements appear to be legal. And so similarly, maybe you could impose limits on the amount of marijuana being, uh, dried marijuana being stored at any one location or any storefront location which doesn't mean they couldn't store it in larger amounts elsewhere. It's the storefront locations that uh, might be of a concern. That's really all I had, and I, I just, you know, frankly, my, my uh, desire here, be because the council did want to get this back in 20 days, was to really put this out there in terms of how uh, I think the council might deal with what we've called the phase two issues. And... Um, I think it's all out there now, and we're just interested in getting some feedback, both Danny and I, and, and we would come back in a few weeks, uh, April uh, 13th, with a, a new draft of an ordinance, if that would be your preference. Thank you. We have question, more questions in Mr. Wiley, Mr. House. For, for uh, Mr. Wiley, um, one of the, I thought that one of the keystones of our conversation leaving council last time was actually to work fundamentally and primarily, I mean, besides the locational things that Danny was talking about, but on the distinction between a collaborative and or a cooperative and a, and a collective, that that really, that, that what we were going to do in this phase two was just make sure that we defined that well. And this other stuff, this, this thing about, I mean, we have, we're trying to, almost like we're trying to reinvent the wheel here. We do have the Attorney General's guidelines on each of these, each of these things, and they're, they're not unclear. They're, I mean, most of the points you made are, are already referenced in the Attorney General's guidelines, the members only and the, all that kind of stuff. And, but then he even goes very specifically into how the um, um, compensation, you know, I identified some of those things. So these things, if we want to be in relatively safe territory, have been covered by the Attorney General to assist the local communities. We needed to, as I recall, get our definition of um, the kind of organization this is, and I was thought, I was thinking we were going to be focusing on that more, um, what, like for instance this issue of um, nonprofit or not for profit, and how that what that means and what a cooperative or collective would be. Um, that definition seemed important to the city council as a whole, and um, so I, I'm ha I've been trying to listen for what you're giving us here that will help us in crafting that definition because that seemed like one of the most important things besides the specific locations. Right. Well, I, I, I'll defer to you. Um, I did not understand the question to be defining cooperatives collective, uh, versus collectives. For, for one thing, I'll tell you, a cooperative is, a, is an actual legal term of art. It's in state law. It's like saying you need to define corporation, and you don't. It's, a corporation is what the state law says it is, and a cooperative is what a state, the state law says it is. It's, you'd actually have to register with the Secretary of State's office. The cooperatives are just a form of legal ownership. Collectives, on the other hand, you know, in the, in the SB 420 uses the term interchangeably. No one knows what a collective is, I mean, in a, in a legal sense, in a defined sense, and I'm not sure how I would define it if I it was asked other than refer to a cooperative. But a collective, you know, there are babysitting collectives where you, a group of people get together and decide to exchange baby, babysitting services. You don't need to form a, a, a legal entity to do that. Uh, it's just, I, I think the concept is that people get together and decide to do it. But I, I'm not, I did not understand that the council 
wanted us to work on defining those terms. Or I, I seem to think that phase two is really mostly about that because it's really important because it's referred to in the guidelines and also in the uh, in the original statutes. You have these words, and on one hand, you just have described very well to us, like on an individual level, individual caregiver and an individual patient, what a what a co or a um, cooperative. I'll get them mixed up here. A collective might be, mm -hmm. and then. Um, we already have a definition in state law about what a cooperative is, and if we in the city were to adopt those two terms, applying those to the what we've been using the word dispensaries, that would be pretty helpful because we'd be tying our local ordinance to something that's already recognized either in state law or in the relatively loose language of these statutes. And for me, that would be a really good starting point because then that would also tie in very naturally to the concept of a Nonprofit, or um, I, I get these. I know they're not the same, but not-for-profit or a nonprofit model, which you've tried to describe to us that this cannot be, be for profit. It's got to be on a reimbursement kind of basis for services or for costs. Those see now the thing begins to hang together really nicely on a local ordinance basis and would fulfill a lot of what Phase Two to me was all about. Mr. House, so that's what I would like us if we could. Uh, we really are going to need your help on that. It, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking, Mr. House, that we're, we haven't heard from the public. Okay. Mr. Hotchkiss has something, but I hope it's quick. And then we're, uh, um, and then, uh, we're going to run out of time, even as it is. So uh, if we could have you, have you have a question, one last question, Mr. Hotchkiss? <laughs> I only take about 20 minutes here. No, I'm kidding. Um, actually, I just wanted to say to Mr. Wiley, I think if in terms, if you think of this whole law and the way it's written in terms of what I was describing, which is somebody helping somebody else get out of bed and then asking the gardener, how often do I water these things, and maybe somebody else gives you some seeds, it actually makes pretty good sense. And where it becomes difficult is that um, local uh, municipalities and districts have taken this and tried to adapt it to their own local preferences and becomes a little tortured then. So then we sudden, and when we bring in a, a storefront, it, it really is like a stretch. Um, on the other hand, people do need this, you know, medically. We see people in wheelchairs, and they're going to have a hard time out there in the garden. Um, so anyway, I just want to clarify that and why I think it was written the way it was. That's obviously a subjective opinion. Um, as, as for being a profit or not, a, a local dispensary could, uh, everybody agree, put all the money in the pot, pay a bunch of money to the people that run it and distribute uh, shares or dollar amounts afterwards to its members, cash, and that would be qualify as non-profit or not-for-profit. Correct? That's correct, but I don't think that's what the statute, the statutes don't say you can distribute the profits and therefore it's okay. They, they say you can't sell, uh, sell marijuana for profit or, well, Okay, have, so yeah. um, you know, I'll let the courts take care of that. The final thing I will just throw out, and I don't think we're going to get into discussion here, is that I would like to hear what Grant particularly objects to, to those points that you brought up from L.A., with the exception of point nine. I can understand that, but so you want let's to get... You want to hear Mr. House's concerns? No, no, I don't want to... Not now, <laughs> not, but I mean... Not now, it's here no, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, but okay. uh, we're trying to get, again, take the questions now, and then the next is the public input. Okay, so, um, folks, we have 14 speakers. Um, uh, no, we don't. Uh, we have 18, and uh, we need to be out of here a few minutes before 2. I can see we're not going to end up with much time to deliberate at the end of this. Um, many of you are familiar faces and familiar voices, so uh, understand that we, we what we're trying to do is head this discussion toward uh, number one is we talked about locations. Number two, we talked about the definition of, uh, of a dis dispensary or a collaborative collective, that those are kind of the two areas that we're, that we're talking about. So if you could focus your, your comments on those, uh, that would be wonderful. And uh, just a reminder to turn off your cell phone. We've had a nice, quiet, uh, uh, non-buzzy uh, hearing so far, and so I'd appreciate that continuing. So the first speaker is Bill, is it Walt, followed by Jen Lemberger. Uh, gentlemen, um, uh, not everyone can grow good medicine, so people need to have someone assist them in that. 
Um, the, the issue of alcohol or these rehabilitation centers, uh, the drugs are in England, um, put up by uh, Prime Minister Brown, put together a panel of 20 scientists to find out about marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, and he found out that alcohol and tobacco are more addictive to the society than marijuana. He went public with his information, and uh, Prime Minister Brown was upset with that and fired him. Um, saying that you're going against what we're trying to do here. And then uh, five of the 20 scientists quit also. Um, the other thing is about these collectives and cooperatives. You've already made some ordinances here, and there's some organizations in town that have storefronts, and they're operating in a nonprofit way. They are receiving reasonable compensation for their efforts. There are several dispensaries in town who are... Uh, passing large amounts of money through their businesses. They're not um, distributing those uh, funds in a non-profit way. They're using them for themselves, for, their, uh, for purchasing other properties, for buying other businesses, for buying expensive sport cars. And so they are definitely not operating in a non-profit way. You've already set up some ordinances here, and I hope that you continue to to do that in a way that allows some nonprofits to operate, because they would like to do some good things for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Uh, Jen Limberger to be followed by Tony Vassallo. Hello, I'm Jen Limberger, the Fighting Back Coordinator, and speaking um, of the the buffer zones. So when we speak of our youth, we're looking at the parks and the school buffer zones. Um, but we'd also like to point out they're not the only population we should be helping. And the existence in the same block of a dispensary and a recovery-related facility provides an atmosphere of permissiveness and temptation in the face of an already vulnerable population. We would also very much like to point out that one of the facilities that's included in that, that list of 40 is um, our Daniel Bryant Youth and Family Treatment Center. So not only is it youth, it's also youth who are in treatment. So it's um, a double whammy for those youth. And the vast majority of them are there for um, our cannabis youth treatment program. So it's, it's a huge issue for that specific population. Um, Council Member Hotchkiss succinctly summarized um, much of our viewpoint in terms of the association between the two. It's not necessarily them entering into the dispensary itself. It's, it's the whole atmosphere of temptation and them trying to pull their lives together while having that right outside where they're receiving treatment or they're living while they're sober. Um, and we'd like to especially express that effective recovery does not end when an individual leaves the premises of where they are receiving treatment. And so we're concerned with the protection of all recovery facilities and that the separation is somewhat arbitrary. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lemberger. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm giving the customary two minutes uh, per speaker on this. Tony Vassallo, followed Chairman, by Sharon Byrne. I'm Tony Vassallo. My wife and I live downtown. And I've revised everything here based on the exposition of the points made by the city attorney. And uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you very much for removing the lower down, west downtown area from consideration for the location of dispensaries. I can't begin to tell you how many people have come up and thanked uh, thank me and, and thank you indirectly for doing that. Um, what I learned here today is that poor statuettes really mean uh, that we need to put the brakes on. And uh, we really need to proceed with, with caution. And I've modified my whole presentation, but I think the attorney was clear in that out-of-pocket expenses for services can be uh, obtained. Uh, reimbursement for expenses is a much more limited uh, thing than profit or not-for-profit not uh, operations. And uh, that profits cannot be distributed. And if that's the law, then that's where we should stay on that on this side of the law until, you know, maybe years from now, things will become more clarified. Um, one or two points I'd like to make in, in regard to some of the discussion made by uh, uh, Councilman House. To get anywhere close to a storefront operation that's going to come up to the standards you're all talking about, I would go back to what we talked about a year ago, and that's a request for proposal, a request for a proposal process be included in the ordinance so that 
the dispensary operators, if you're going to have a few storefronts, let them compete and let seconds. the top couple uh, win out in competition. And I'm sure uh, you know the ones that would float to the top. Five and, seconds. And uh, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Byrne followed by Christina Pizarro. Well, I want to second Tony's thank you from West Downtown for taking us out of the zone. I actually agree with the change up in proceedings today. Don't discuss locations till you have definitions nailed. Um, and I really appreciate the research that Steve Wiley has done to get you to some definitions. And I want to sympathize with uh, Grant House's um, question about how do we define collectives and the answer is because they aren't. The state didn't bother to do it for us. We're going to have to do that work as a city. And as you pointed out, Mr. Hodgkiss, every city is attacking that differently. Mr. Hodgkiss, I think you were very correct in your assessment that the relationships between patients and caregivers, cultivators, a waterer, a gardener, it probably was supposed to be personal, small, close-knit, closed-loop, and maybe have to pay the gardener for his time so he doesn't have to go get a day job, but it wasn't supposed to be a business. And I think what we're dealing with is the fact that it has mushroomed into a business, and the courts will adjudicate that out. As Mr. Wiley goes on in his exercise, I really appreciate him showing us the Los Angeles points, because Los Angeles is the first city that I know of to really attempt rigorously to define what a collective is, how they can behave, who can belong, what kinds of transactions they can have. When you go down this road of doing what the state did not do for you, you're going to have to define collectives from two angles, one of which we've already discussed, the L.A. side, which is what's the day-to-day -day operation look like, who can belong, how does it work. But the second side, which is not addressed uh, much by Los Angeles but is by the city of Arcata, is where does cultivation take place? Can the, you know, we've already said probably should take place within the county of Santa Barbara, so you'd probably have to talk to the county about that and how they'd feel about that, where they'd want that to happen. And where can it be grown? Can it be next to a middle school? We don't know. Things like that. So the cultivation side has to be addressed as well, and I think the city of Arcata did a pretty decent job on that. Thank you. Thank you. Christina Pizarro, to, followed by Juanita Medina. Uh, nobody here. Juanita Medina is not here. Uh, Janet Rouse, to be followed by John Stanley. Hi. I'm here today to ask you to take um, up the prudent course and err on the side of caution in establishing the locations. The parents I've heard from would like you to know that they support the school district recommendations for the 1,000 foot buffers and the limited hours of operation that you're going to hear about. Please consider the locations as they relate to social equity. Not only have residents, schools, and recovery centers asked for protection from dispensaries, please consider that families who may not be able to afford to live outside of your pot zones are also unfairly impacted by the attractive nuisances that are created and permitted by the city. And um, I think that's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rouse. So, John Stanley to be followed by Tamara Erickson. I support the, the council in thinking about taking this law that's very personal and close between caregiver and patient and thinking, I'd like to have you think about how you're going to, with your limited finances, verify the source of the marijuana, the profit that's being made, and the personnel control. I'd, I've called one of the dispensaries, and if I have a Schedule One prescription, I'm a member, I guess. I don't know. Uh, whether the whether rent of a building is out-of-pocket expense for services, whether buying a car is out-of-pocket expenses for running the service, on a location perspective, I support Grant Houses. If, it, if you decided to go ahead with this without really bolting down those situations, I, I agree that the 3900 facility has been there for 10 years, hasn't had any complaints. However, moving it to 16 South Lacumba Road is not so good because it's a block and a half or two blocks from Hope School, and it's in a family shopping center, a large one, uh, 
and I own a, I own a building next door which has um, medical patients, dental patients that are um, handicapped, some of them, and children, families, and this is not suitable. Thank you. Uh, Tamara Erickson to be followed by David Hughes. Hi, good afternoon. Um, for the past 35 years, my family has owned a hotel on the 500 block of State Street, and I have personally watched an industry sprout in that neighborhood um, that requires enormous police and fire resources as recently as this past weekend, as I'm sure you read. And uh, apparently a lot of those funds have been slated to be cut, which is unfortunate but probably necessary. And my point to you is, uh, as I'm sort of alarmed to hear some of the things that you've said, Mr. House, is that if you open the door to, to dispensaries as an industry in, in any way, there will never be a way to close it. And we witnessed that there firsthand. I'm sure the council who invited that industry that, that we have had to live with um, were optimistic, as Mr. House is, about their ability to enforce it and, and the um, businesses' willingness to be good neighbors, but history, unfortunately, has proven them wrong, and I hope that the same decision won't be a part of your legacy. Thanks. Thank you. David Hughes to be followed by Bud Andrews. Yes, good afternoon. My name is David Hughes. I first hope that uh, uh, City Attorney Wiley satisfactorily answered your question, Mr. House, about the sale of medical marijuana. The Supreme Court and a couple of appellate court decisions have said it can't be sold Mr. Wiley cited to you the statute that says nonprofit, and the Attorney General's guidelines, it's page 10, paragraph 5, the bottom of that indicates exactly what Mr. Wiley said. They can recover costs, but they can't be sold, can't be a profit. Uh, a point was made by Mr. House and some of the council members, why do we need more regulations and detailed regulations when we have the Attorney General's guidelines? Well, I think as Mr. Wiley and others have indicated, the Attorney General's guidelines and the statute don't answer all your questions. If you're going to allow dispensaries in the city, you're going to have to regulate them. <clears throat> Let me give you three examples you're going to have to think about. One, what about the delivery of medical marijuana? Does it make sense for a collective or cooperative to be able to deliver to one of their members? Yeah, maybe, if they're in their home, can't come to the dispensary. Are you going to allow the delivery of medical marijuana to offices, to restaurants that people call up? Are you going to allow medical marijuana dispensaries to advertise delivery services? I would hope not. It's happening now in the city. But it shouldn't happen for a collective cooperative who only has members that don't need to advertise. Number two, you have to consider this issue of membership. You're going to have to have regulations as who can be members of a collective or cooperative. Mr. Wiley has indicated to you it appears the state would have to limit that by city or county. And you're going to have to have some requirements as to whether you're going to limit that. Another reason why you're going to have to limit membership to a city or county is a third area that the state doesn't cover, and that's the area of cultivation. The collective or, cooperative, collective or cooperative has to cultivate its own medical marijuana among its members. And unless you restrict the membership to the city or county, you would allow a collective or cooperative to obtain medical marijuana from sources outside the county. I don't think you want that. Three examples. Let your attorney use the court decisions in this case to provide you with detailed regulations for this dispensaries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Um, Bud Andrews to be followed by Dr. John Arguello, perhaps. Arguella, perhaps. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Bud Andrews. I'm here representing the Santa Barbara School Districts. I had uh, three points that I wanted to make. Uh, the first is that I was dismayed to see that none of my schools were on your list of high priority facilities. Uh, I think a reasonable interpretation of that is that they're not considered high priorities, which I find upsetting. Uh, the second one, Mr. Wiley briefly addressed on the edible marijuana situation. The only thing I would like to add to that is that edible, edible marijuana, marijuana in the form of edibles, is virtually indistinguishable from other kinds of foods, which from the school perspective is very, very difficult. And being the guy in charge of serious discipline issues at school, I can assure you that that has been problematic over the last few years I've been in that position. And lastly... Uh, to, reiter to reiter reiterate what uh, Ms. Rouse said, please consider the five recommendations the school board made, but especially increasing the radii to 1,000 feet and to uh, consider controlling the hours that the schools or the uh, businesses would be in, in operation. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Is, it, is it Arguelles? Is John, that... John Arguelles. Arguelles. Councilman, followed by Heather Poet. There you go. Uh, Councilman White, Councilman Grant, Councilman Hodgkiss. I op operate a dental practice, which is uh, right next door to 16 South Lacumba Road at 38 South Lacumba Road. I've been there for 17 years, and I oppose the uh, location of a dispensary next to my office. We keep drugs in our office. I think that's a temptation that I really don't want to have to uh, deal with break-ins and deal with the police department. My concern is for my patients, for my younger patients. I'm a family practitioner. We have another family practitioner in the building. I think it's not an appropriate location. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gwellis. I had their poet to be followed by Derek Weston. Afternoon. Um, first, I just really wanted to quickly say I really respect and appreciate all the work that everybody is putting into this. I know that it sometimes feels to me like an impossible um, an impossible thing to get hammered out. Uh, this yes, last afternoon um, I found out that the tenants and property owners uh, around 16 South were um, going to have a problem, and I, I kind of imagined that. I have not met in the nine years that I have been helping do this uh, people that don't have a problem with it, and um, even though. We regularly come across um, citizens who have problems with it. I try to speak to them in a place where they could possibly understand it from a perspective of a sick individual in their family. I spoke with um, uh, Dr. Khan DDS and also a, uh, a owner of a small um, children's clothing shop. They both were uh, opposed but um, at least willing to let me provide them with a little bit more information and education. And I think that um, that's what the city needs is more information and education and that there have been problems and that I hope that as a city we can work together to provide, you know, a, a relatively few but really, really well run and, and really strongly reg regulated um, places where patients can go and not have to do it in such an awkward way as 215 basically didn't state. You could drive a truck through the meaning of it. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Derek Weston to be followed by Francisca Edwards. Yes, my name is Derek Weston. I'm here on behalf of the Santa Barbara uh, Patients Group. You just heard from Heather Poet. As you know, that is uh, an operation that functions as a collective. It uh, grows all of the marijuana only by members of the collective and distributes it only to them, functions on a nonprofit basis. Uh, we believe strongly that these uh, operations should be very carefully regulated and anticipate not having any problem with the kind of uh, restrictions that Mr. Wiley has suggested. First thing I want to comment uh, on is that the primary reason we are here is because the location of the patients group at 3128 State Street uh, has not been allowed. And initially, you were moving toward a process of having zones a certain distance from a park. We are not uh, too close to a school or not too close to uh, any sensitive um, recovery facility, but we are within 500 feet of Mackenzie Park as the crow flies, although not, not by a reasonable walking path. So that if you, since you now have moved away from a buffer requirement to a block face requirement, if the 3,000 block of State Street were included, the patients group would be delighted to stay there. Their landlord would be very delighted to have them stay there. So that would be obviously be our number one preference. I do want to say that, that the decision before you about including two parcels on South Lacumbra does not involve approval of actually having a dispensary at those locations. So those blocks... All of the parcels in those blocks allow dispensaries, except for two specific parcels that happen to be zone CP. 
And you've now made a separate decision that it's appropriate to have a dispensary in certain CP zones around a cottage hospital. So the only question is, does it make sense to exclude these two? Eight seconds. Oh, okay. Does it make sense to include these two South Lacumbra parcels? We think there's not a rational basis. We'd love to have the 3,000 buck included. Whether a dispensary should be permitted at those locations will be discussed and dealt with in a public hearing. It's completely separate. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Francisca Edwards followed by Hans Edwards. Okay, Mr. Edwards, three and a half minutes. Honorable council members, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, with all due respect, I would like to ask, uh, how can we justify restricting uh, uh, distances between rehabs and dispensaries when there are no such uh, distance uh, uh, restrictions between uh, rehabs and liquor stores, or worse, bars and similar entertainment places. Um, when the main addiction is alcohol and a much bigger temptation, uh, all, all they do, all they need is an ID to show their age. So it is a security thing, and uh, the intense security measures of dispensaries is a protection and the carefully distributed, careful distribution of cannabis to people who can demonstrate a true medical need is a protection in contrast to what the liquor stores do. Um, when staff asked CADA to list all the major facilities, uh, they also included recovery houses. And I respectfully submit also that Recovery houses are not treatment facilities. Uh, recovery houses are where treatment re uh, recipients go after treatment has been completed and where they are asked to commit to recovery. Example is uh, Hotel de, de Riviera. Um, uh, what is uh, a treatment center then? Well, there are some criteria that the staff had uh, laid down. Uh, the treatment, the intensity of the treatment, presumably, the numbers of patients that are being handled, uh, the sensitivity of the patients when they come out of that treatment. Uh, so I think the paradigm case uh, for such a, a treatment center is the cottage hospital itself, which on its fifth floor, uh, five, it's called Five East, uh, has accommodations for 25 beds and a treatment period of three to seven days. So they can really uh, go through a lot of uh, population uh, with that kind of system. And uh, the intensive detox and uh, men mental health treatment uh, with psychiatrists uh, present and so forth is unequaled in any other uh, such uh, treatment center. So I would say this is the paradigm. And... Um, I agree that uh, uh, we should have a dispensary in the, in the uh, cottage hospital area. Uh, however, if the concern is about proximity uh, to dispensaries of such treatment facilities, then I think you have a, a major problem there. Uh, because uh, these patients in the three to seven day period are still the very most sensitive also. Um, I looked at the, now, Cottage Hospital uh, also produces a list of rehabilitation centers, which I would like to pass on to you in the next uh, opportunity. And um, I don't have copies of these. And uh, this, and there are other lists that are available online. I have also one from uh, Drug Strategies that list, uh, that happened to list exactly 17 um, places on its list, and what is conspicuously different uh, about these lists and the list from the staff seconds. is, yes, is that uh, Cottage Hospital is not included there, and at the same time, uh, our staff list includes places that should not be there, uh, in short, and they are not on these lists. They're not on the uh, uh, list from the Cottage Hospital or, or any other list that I have ever seen. Okay, your time so, is up. Uh, okay, so then I'll just conclude that uh, I would say that uh, 
I would recommend that we do not follow Los Angeles. Uh, they have a special mess there. That, and Santa Barbara has a good reputation for having created a wise ordinance. And please don't follow Los Angeles example and eviscerate a perfectly good ordinance. Okay, by zoning Mr. Edwards, we're going to have to wrap up. You've had four minutes. Thank you. Zoning dispensaries out of existence. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Forney, but followed by Bonnie Raisin. Patricia Forney. Patrick. Patrick. Sorry. Patrick. Excuse me. So Hi, Patrick. That is Steve. Chair White, uh, Councilmember Hodgkiss, and Councilmember House. Um, I've reiterated in, reiterated in the past that I believe that uh, something that's missing out of this ordinance is the uh, provision that the uh, recipient of the permit provide nonprofit status filed with the state. Uh, I also uh, understand the disparity and the uh, mix-up between collectives and cooperatives, and we can, I feel that we can just view them as cooperatives. That way there's some sort of method to uh, have them as an incorporated or unincorporated association within the state, and that also, sh too, should be a filing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hodgkiss, Council Member Hodgkiss, last time in the council meeting brought up an interesting point, which is where does the cannabis come from? And in following um, uh, Mr. Wiley's uh, uh, logistics of, of uh, the dispensary, the collective providing and growing it for themselves, uh, about 10 years ago we took on that assignment of uh, growing collectively and uh, engaged uh, Jim Anderson and the point person at the district attorney's office to be aware of the property and the size and the amount. Uh, when that was grown and finished, then we contacted the mayor, who contacted the city administrator, who contacted Cam Sanchez, who contacted the uh, chief of narcotics, who contacted me, and we went over the amounts and what was to be given away to patients and what was to be then dispersed amongst to collect back the revenue that was spent on that. So there is, there is, there is a design and there is methods of following that in a way that provides cannabis and reimbursement and follows a collective model. Then there was a state case in which it stated that the collective sometimes couldn't satiate the needs of the collective members and had to, go outside, seconds. had to go outside of the purview. And uh, the state case, which we should bring to the attention of this body because it's important as we're looking at these things to follow the Attorney General's office. seconds. And the last thing I'll say in wrapping up then, I recommend you talk to Jacob Applesmith at the Attorney General's office. He's been there 20 years. And uh, he's been superseded by two members uh, uh, who have been following this closely, and they can perhaps add to Mr. Wiley's analysis for okay. you so you can better could forward that to Mr. Wiley, and that might be help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie Raisin to be followed by Robert Burke. Good afternoon, members of the Ordinance Committee. I'm <clears throat> Bonnie Raisin. After hearing Mr. Wiley's presentation, I don't know how you can, in good faith, act on statutes that are so problematic, uh, in spite of Los Angeles's good efforts. Um, it's, it sounds to me like it is uh, not judicious to make any decisions regarding the dispensary, the dis the uh, medical marijuana uh, dispensaries. The underlying issues, and you are condoning medical marijuana facilities, and therefore indirect is your condoning of the accessibility of marijuana. From the beginning, I have held firm that marijuana is a gateway drug, both leading away from and into the use of harder drugs. Prescription medication Vicodin, Oxycontin, etc., are being it's being investigated right now by the Attorney General of the state rigorously because of the invalidity and the illegal prescriptions that are being distributed, causing documented death. Marijuana can fall into this category. A doctor must be convinced by a patient to prescribe all sorts of things, but doctors are not gods. They are human beings, and they can fall short of their mark. <clears throat> a pharmacy existing is the only, and I mean only, place seconds. for a medical marijuana prescription to be written. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raisin. Robert Burke, followed by Donna Lee Barranco. 
Good morning, Council Member, or good afternoon, Council Members. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, three things I want to say. One is I want to congratulate you and personally appreciate the fervor with which you are devoting your time to this. You do it with intelligence and your, your ears are open and I think your minds are as well. So I thank you for the attitude that you bring to the subject. Because when I listen to you sitting back there, my, my mind is like a pinball machine trying to go, you know, with all the levers. And I just, Bleh. I'm glad they're doing it and I'm not. The main point I'm being here is I presented to Mr. Uh, House my uh, remarks about the uh, language. I'm not concerned so much with the issues. I leave that to you. You're much more intelligent about it than I am. But I'm concerned about the language, and it, it's too much an official ease. I find it that it uh, obfuscates some places rather than uh, helps. And my point is that if Santa Barbara wants to be uh, the template, the model, that other people throughout the country or even around the world might use either as a source for their own how they would write their laws or as a matter of research that we have very precise language uh, that's well written English so I'm concerned more about the language of it than what you're doing okay. and the third point is as a person who is been in and out of 12-step programs for quite a while my uh, the debate between a thousand feet 500 feet it seems to me to be rather mute. If I'm a compulsive personality who wants to smoke some milk, drink some alcohol, or whatever is my drug of choice, food, I'm going to walk five miles. And so I offer that uh, as part of the debate. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Donna Lee Bronco followed by Sefton Graham. Good afternoon. There are a few points I'd just like to make. Number one, I think it's very difficult to even move forward until we know actually what we're talking about and the definitions are clearly defined. Number two, while I'm not opposed to medical marijuana, I do think that there should be uh, more regulations so that we can watch what the doctors are doing, watch what the people are doing, because I know for a fact that people take it and they sell it. And um, I would hope that it would be more regulated, more of a, like a pharmacy type of way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marie Mender or Mendes, followed by Betty. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Mender. Mm -hmm. um, I, too, really respect and uh, appreciate how carefully you're weighing this very difficult subject. I'm a nurse at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. We are an acute care facility. Um, psychiatric and chemical dependency, and I work with people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol every day and psychiatric illnesses every day. And I want to make a couple of points, and I really ask you to err on the side of caution here. I'm not here as a nurse today. I'm here as the mother of two young girls, 13 and 15, and my girls are not into smoking pot or into the wrong things right now. And I don't have a self-righteous attitude about that. I'm very grateful that they're not. But I would like you to please consider that thousand-yard buffer, thousand-foot buffer for the schools. I don't want my girls to see that. People, I'm a nurse. I'm in the business of alleviating human suffering. Medical marijuana, yes. Recreational use and my children having um, exposure to that, no. Please, it's hard enough to raise responsible citizens. I would also like you to consider the hours of operation being restricted, just like they do in Los Angeles. And I would like you to restrict or ban the edible items that look like Rice Krispie treats and candy. That is a basic moral problem in my mind, a, hu a public health issue, not politics. One more thing I'd like to say is you cannot unring a bell. The human toll that alcoholism has taken on our society, our families, uh, why do you want to open another Pandora's box and make me medical marijuana, or, or rather recreational marijuana, so readily available? You'll never be able to unring that bell. It seconds. permeates all of our society the way alcohol has. Any tax revenue generated will pale in comparison to the toll it will take on human beings. Thank you. Is, is there a Betty that wanted to speak? Could you give your last name, please? Nelson. Nelson, thank you. Um, council members, you all will go down in the, the book of record for all your hard work. And I think you're honest. 
and I think you're doing a hard job. Uh, you did mention today there was one uh, place on State Street that was approved. Where is that at? Because usually they just ignore State Street. I don't hear much about that. 3128. Where? 3128. I was referring to the one on Upper State Street in the 3000 block that's been there for nine or ten years. That was the one I was referring to. Okay. And that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. So is there anybody else who wishes to speak at this point? Come on up and, and please hand in a slip after you're done. Oh, I did. Second gram, green light. Oh, I think okay. I just, anyway, uh, I just wanted to point out that Thanks. we are collective. We have incorporated with the Secretary of State. We're not a babysitter collective, but uh, we are a corporation. So if a corporation is defined, a collective can also be a corporation. A collective can also be a cooperative. These are legitimized, they are recognized by the Secretary of State. So uh, if anyone has a question about that, I'd be happy to answer it. And uh, just while I'm up here, I wanted to mention that we seem to have been written out of the ordinance again. And Council Member Grant House, uh, I remember you mentioning attrition in the last meeting, and it doesn't seem to be reflected in the new draft. For, I think it's it also affects Milpas, 500 Milpas. They're one block out of the zone now. So 631 Olive, 500 Milpas. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak at this point? Okay, come on up, please. <clears throat> Hand in a slip if you haven't already. Yes, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Marceau, and I live on Miramonte Drive here in Santa Barbara, and I use the uh, dispensary <clears throat> on, on Upper State Street. Um, I find them to be as diligent as possible in making sure that they get the proper uh, requirements to dispense to individuals driver's license plus a letter from your doctor. I have AIDS and the medications that I take make me very sick and of course when I first found out that I had AIDS I immediately dropped about 30 pounds. The marijuana that is dispensed to me I'm given counsel as to what I counsel them as to what I need and I need appetite stimulant uh, because the medications that I take are very strong and they get they make you sick and you just can't eat anything well you need sleep and you need food to stay healthy I'm already on the medications now for seven years and I just wanted to say that I thank you very much for taking into consideration the, the placement of where they are uh, because I don't want to see this going out to the general public I want to remain um, uh, an entity that can that is given only to those who require it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, then uh, I will close the public testimony at this point, and uh, it's back to the committee. Mr. House. Uh, yes, I'll just um, just a couple of remarks. I really appreciate the people coming out and sharing their concerns with us, and I um, I take these notes to review later and to help affect my um, uh, my, my consideration of these things. And I want to really thank everyone for coming in from all the different perspectives, um, uh, Mr. Wiley, um, for a future. Um, uh, conversation and I have here a copy of the guidelines for the security and non-diversion of marijuana grown for medical use from the Attorney General and I really believe this needs to be part of our discussion because many of the questions that have come up today and issues that you raised are covered um, very um, I mean in, in real uh, deliberation and real detail here um, and issues that we have um, that we're struggling with are, are addressed uh, quite 
uh, directly, um, even uh, business forms and what kinds of, I mean, any group that is collectively or cooperatively cultivating and distributing marijuana for medical purposes should be organized and operated in a manner that ensures the security of the crop and safeguards against diversion for non-medical purposes. And it goes on and talks specifically about statutory cooperatives, uh, collectives, uh, defines the relationships within them and the way that uh, funds are to be dealt with. Um, um, it has to do with cultivation, talks about membership, nonprofit operation, business licenses, sales tax, and seller's permits. I mean, it's very detailed, and I know you're very familiar with this, but it seems like this should be at the core of our discussion here so that we're continuing to meet the fundamental requirement of being consistent with existing state law and the uh, guidance that we've fortunately been given by the Attorney General's office, and it would really be helpful. And um, I think um, I'd had a question uh, from Mr. Hotchkiss, which I'll quickly answer. Um, the number eight is an example. Um, this is the prohibit for sale, right? Well, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's more than an attempt to do away with the quote dispensaries or the collectives or cooperatives. I mean, that's really, I mean, that's a very heart of what's going on by the district attorney in LA, and it's a, and they, they got themselves in a terrible situation by waiting way too long to get their ordinances up. Unfortunately, Santa Barbara didn't. We didn't wait. We jumped right in and took care of um, having a good ordinance to start with. But um, they're doing cleanup and they're doing it in, in, with a. Um, off with their heads kind of an approach, and that is fundamentally a problem. The uh, other one with regards to the, no, the amount um, of the uh, medicine, um, it, I mean, it may be practicable, as Mr. Wiley's suggesting, but it's very close if it's not blatantly um, uh, not unconstitutional based on the previous. And, and so there's, there's a couple of things there that are just they miss the mark as far as um, what I think that uh, Prop 215 was talking about. and. We, but I really want to just go back to focus on this one piece here. A lot of those issues, even that that I just mentioned, have been addressed by the Attorney General. And I think we, all of us in the room as well as here on the uh, dais for the committee need to have these gui this guidance. If we, were to, um, if we were to include the Attorney General's guidelines in our local ordinance, we would we would answer those issues and questions that have been posed to us and it would really strengthen our own ability to regulate and effectively keep the marijuana that should be used for medical purposes out of a recreational context. And I agree with a number of the speakers tonight or today um, that that is a fundamental goal. It's to be able to provide it as uh, Many of the people who argue against the dispensaries say, first off, they recognize the valid need for medical marijuana for patients who truly have those needs. So we need to really make sure our regulations provide that distinction, and I don't hear much objection to that. Um, so when we come back next time, I hope that we'll get this distributed to all of us, and we can have this as a part of our, 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 our conversation here locally. Thank you, Mr. House. Mr. Hotchkiss? Okay, um, I don't think the Attorney General's guidelines are enough. That's what we're hearing here. So uh, we need to go for more than that. But I'm not sure we're going to agree to those. So I wonder if, um, Mr. House, with the exception of those two um, paragraphs that you mentioned, are the rest uh, of these that are on the screen now basically satisfactory? Uh, Mr. Chair? Um, we have, we, in our uh, existing regulation and in our adapted one, the new one that we have, we've covered most of that territory, but in language that is fairly comprehensible here locally. So we've got most of that covered. Um, and I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of going with L.A. even as a model because of how uh, flawed and contentious their implementation of, implementation of this has been and how subject to challenge it will be. Whereas what we've got had good guidance from our attorney here in, in crafting our existing ordinance and it has gotten us um, where we are not putting ourselves in harm's way in terms of challenges, I think it's pretty clean. So I'd like to just stay away from this one, especially that blatant prohibition against the using money, if you will, to transfer ownership. I mean, that's already called out as, as, as a legitimate as long as you're within the collective or cooperative and that you're um, meeting your expense needs. And we've already got that in our, um, our existing uh, ordinance. So if we need to clarify that and strengthen that, we can do it. We've got so that's my answer to you. I don't. I just don't want to go here. This is this is fraught with danger and it's uh, set up as a pit of snakes for challenge. Well, Thank you, Mr. It, House. 
Trash. Mr. Chairman, in response, I don't find it fraught with danger, but since we can't agree on some of these things we're going round and round on, could we agree at least to move this forward with a 500-foot prohibition on all recovery centers as a pro proposed by uh, staff? And that's the 17 major recovery centers. Uh, um, Mr. Hotchkiss, the concern that I would have, again, I get back to the Cottage Hospital, whereas I certainly have the highest regard for Mr. Werfton. I know we have a, a nurse from Cottage that, that spoke to that as well. My own feeling is that, that still that community, again, it's, it is the, the location where I think the substance, control substances can be the most res responsibly distributed and it's most conveniently. So I'm still uh, tilting in, the dire in that direction for that particular location uh, on that front. I, I might put in an, uh, my uh, couple of cents worth on what we have on the board. I would appreciate looking at this more closely and having more dialogue uh, with Mr. Wiley on this. Um, I'm just, um, my eyes and my head uh, have a hard time getting around that that quickly. And uh, so I'd just appreciate a chance to, to, to look at that more closely. I'll answer your question, Ms. Tosh, because I think that we uh, steered away from a circumference approach, which we had tried to do before, to a block face approach, which really has merit and has been very helpful to us. Um, and it also avoids uh, some of the issues that may come up in the future if new facilities were to be proposed. This really helps uh, our approach that we've taken, and Mr. Cato may want to speak to it, but it has been really helpful to us in organizing um, and, and, and helping anyone who would be making a proposal to know where they could actually make a legitimate proposal and be uh, enter into the process. Maybe Mr. Cato would like to comment on that. Mr. Cato. Mr. Chair, quickly, um, that's exactly what I did for these maps. I just took, I took the radius of 500 feet and then translated that into a block base. Mm. And those revised block bases are attachment seven of the staff report. So that me we've kept that methodology of the block bases is all I want to say. Uh, Mr. Hotchkiss. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cato, we have not even gone over the school thing yet, right? We haven't put that overlay. So we haven't addressed the schools yet, correct or not? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Councilmember Hotchkiss, my understanding is that the, the direction that we got from Council was 500 feet from schools and parks was what we were going to go with. I haven't changed that at all on these maps because that's... That's how I understood it through the previous ordinance committee hearings and the council hearings. Okay, so this what you put up was matches both the schools and uh, recovery facilities. Five hundred feet from schools, parks, and the seventeen recovery facilities and youth centers and all that stuff. No, just th just those three things. Okay. So um, we are obviously running out of time. Um, we're, I mean, I, not being uh, that experienced, and I'm assuming that the Ordinance Committee does not customarily run past 2 o'clock. This is our time. Okay. Um, and that we have, we're, we are tentatively scheduled for a few weeks, April 13th. 13th. Now, um, I'm feeling like we're going to need something, need further discussion and then drawing up a draft ordinance. I don't think we have material to do that with. Is that, uh, is that consistent, Mr. Wiley, with how you would see this thing uh, moving forward at this point? Perfect. So in two weeks, uh, we could come back and have basically take what we've heard today and read today and the additional material that council's given us, discuss that further in two weeks. Does that work with, uh, with Mr. Hodgkin? Yeah, I'll move to continue this for uh, to two weeks from now. And I also want to make sure that we do have the Attorney General's guidelines when we come back. I think that's really an important um, tool. Okay. And, um, and uh, so there's a motion for that. Uh, we're already Mr. scheduled Chair. for an ordinance committee meeting. In two Mr. weeks? Chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have ordinance committee on the, tw there are already items scheduled for the 23rd and the 30th. The 6th were closed. I, there's no, there's no council that I meant. I, I know the items on the yeah. 30th and if we, yeah. Okay. Okay. So two weeks then, we'll just bring this back in two weeks for further discussion. And I think we would just continue it so we, we wouldn't necessarily be taking more public comment and yeah, we'd hope we'd have a chance to, to be able to, uh, to chew on this together.
And, and Mr. Chair, I'm not clear, Mr. House, what you mean by the Attorney General guidelines. Uh, you you have copies. I, have I just have a copy. I don't know if anybody no, else does. I want to make sure. We each do. I, I, I have not had a meeting where someone in the audience hasn't handed me a copy of the Attorney General's guidelines. <laughs> so they're out there. Yeah. Okay, well. then, then it's a heads up that for me there'll be um, uh, very important tools as we craft our own ordinance. And I'll just give you that heads up. Thanks. And, and for me, it's looking at the material that we've received from uh, Mr. Wiley today and seeing how that can be uh, uh, folded into what we have. So I have a motion to second for continuing this, this discussion in two weeks. Second.